It's time for a wellness time revolution. For a wellness revolution. Brought to you by Hotsi Health and Wellness Center. Honest discussion on maintaining health and wellness naturally to enjoy a better quality of life. He's the doctor fighting to let you keep your doctor. Now, Dr. Stephen Hotsi. Dr. Hotsi's Wellness Revolution podcast is brought to you by Physicians Preference Pharmacy, formerly Hotsi Pharmacy. Welcome to Dr. Hotsey's Wellness Revolution. I'm Stacey Banfield here with Dr. Stephen Hotsey, founder of the Hotsey Health and Wellness Center. We've got a great show today. We have got Dr. Peter Bregan. He's a psychiatrist, and Dr. Hotsey calls him a contrarian. He's not your typical psychiatrist, so we're really intrigued to hear what he has to tell us today. Dr. Hotsey. Thanks so much, Stacey, and thank each one of you for joining us on Dr. Hotsey's Wellness Revolution podcast and YouTube. Glad to have you here. Remember, I believe that you and everyone needs to have a doctor and a staff of professionals who can coach you onto a path of health and wellness naturally. So as you mature, you got energy, you got vitality, and you're enthusiastic about life, no matter what the circumstances is. And remember, enthusiasm comes from the Greek word, meaning means being filled with the Spirit of God. So when you're enthusiastic, God's filled you up and you're excited to be alive because he's put you here and you got a purpose in your life, and it's exciting to be alive. We're excited to be alive, and I hope you are, and I know that our guest today on the program, Dr. Peter Bregan, who is really a giant uh, in natural approaches to health when it comes to psychiatry. He's been on the forefront, on the cutting edge of exposing the, the, the adverse effects of all these psychotropic drugs that have been produced by the pharmaceutical companies and been, uh, have been uh, promoted and fostered by the uh, psychiatry profession and given to patients which have made them feel terrible and do terrible things. Dr. Bregan is a uh, Harvard-trained psychiatrist who has written numerous books. He's been called by many on my side of the aisle the conscience of psychiatry because he's exposed not only the adverse effect of these harmful psychotropic drugs but also uh, psychotherapy uh, that dealt with convulsive therapy where they literally shock people, where they put paddles on their brains like they do on people's hearts and they shock them. This is called electroconvulsive therapies exposed that and the harmful effects of that as well as lobotomies. There was a series of times when people, when they acted crazy, guess what? The psychiatrist sent them their good buddy who was a neurosurgeon and they cut off their, they cut off their frontal lobe. It, it was called a frontal lobotomy, and you may have heard this said, said in the old days, I remember this, this was said when somebody acted up, we'd kind of kid among ourselves, said, boy, he needs a good frontal lobotomy, doesn't he? <laughs> so, so, but, yeah. but it, it's not funny, but that was, that, was a, that was a joke we used to say when people acted up, but that's a terrible uh, destructive procedure, and Dr. Bregan exposed this and basically shut this down in the Western world. Uh, so, we're so glad. And by the way, Dr. Bregan has read, written numerous books, and I'm going to just give you the titles of several of these. Toxic Psychiatry, Talking Back to Prozac, Medication Madness, which is just wonderful, and it's about Excellent, how, excellent book. Just a wonderful book. Medication Madness, The Role of Psychiatric Drugs in the Case of Violence, Suicide, and Crime. It is a must-read, and you can see how... Much of the problem that we've seen in society with increased suicide rates, destructive, harmful behavior, even homicides, have been directly related to the use of these psychotropic drugs, particularly SSRI antidepressants like Prozac and drugs like Effexor and others. He's also written Psychiatric Drug Withdrawal, a guide for prescribers, therapists, and patients. He's written Guilt, Shame, and Anxiety, Understanding and Overcoming Negative Emotions. He and his wife live in Ithaca, New York. Now, New York is part of the Union, and it is up northeast somewhere. <laughs> I think so. It? Yeah, it's up I think north. I've heard of it. We're down here in Texas, so, <laughs> so we're glad to have someone in New York thinking <clears throat> uh, logically. By the way, Dr. Bregan, before I bring you on in my introduction here, uh, I want to yes. I want to tell our audience that when I was in medical school, I graduated from medical school in 1976, the University of Texas at Houston. 
while I was in medical school, you have to do a rotation through psychiatry. Now, I may not have told you this, uh, Dr. Bregan. No, no, I but, didn't know this. But I read a book while I'm in medical school by Dr. Thomas Saz. Mm-hmm. And Dr. Saz wrote a book called uh, Myth of Mental Illness. Myth of Mental Illness. So I read this book before I took psychiatry. So I go into my psych- I go into psychiatry, <laughs> and look, I, I'm not a person that doesn't speak my mind. And they started coming up with all this, I call it crap about, you know, people aren't responsible for their actions. They have a mental illness. You know, it's not their fault. They're sick. We need to treat them with drugs. And it absolved people of their personal responsibility, which Dr. Says says is ridiculous. It's the myth of mental illness. They gave, absolved people of personal responsibility. So I advocated this during my psychiatry course Oh boy. Uh, to the psychiatrist. And guess what they promptly did with me? They failed me in psychiatry. And then they went to the board and tried to throw me out of medical school. Thank goodness I had good relationships w- with the surgeons who were on the board. And they, they supported me and they kept me on. And I ended up graduating. I did have to take retake psychiatry, though, uh, in clinical rotation in psychiatry the month before I, two months before I graduated from med school. It was kind of the make or break. And at that point, we had a truce. They knew I didn't believe what they said. I was simply going to write down the answers, and I was going to nod my head, and we were going to have a truce. We had a truce. We didn't fight it out, and I ended up graduating from med school. The rest is history. But that's why I have been so enamored and so appreciative of Dr. Bregan's work. Now, Dr. Bregan, give us you have a, you have a very similar background to me in, in how you came to the conclusion, your first introduction to psychi- psychiatric medicine when you were a student at Harvard and working in the uh, working at some of the asylums in that area, and what you saw the result, the patients, their treatment, and how it affected them. I saw the same thing when I was in med school, doing my psychiatric rotation. So why don't you talk about your first experience with psychiatric patients? And what made, what made you decide at that point something was wrong with what was going on? Well, it's a good beginning. I, I was only 18 years old. I was a freshman at Harvard College, not at the psychiatric residency where I, I went later. And um, a friend of mine asked me to volunteer. I didn't even plan to be a psychiatrist. I was going to be a professor of American history and literature, maybe a lawyer. <laughs> and um, I went out to the state mental hospital and it reminded me uh, immediately of my Uncle Dutch's descriptions of liberating a Nazi extermination camp. Big, big rooms, dungeons filled with people, no one there to help them, sitting around, stunned-looking, robotic, drugged. Later, I would find out that many had been lobotomized. This was 1954, and I uh, and lobotomies were... Uh, at the tail end of their heyday at that point. Um, But somehow, and I think this is a a key aspect, uh, uh, perhaps of you too, uh, when I saw the conditions under which these people were living, I did not think that it was because of something wrong with them. It was so clear that no one could be sane or healthy or happy or successful or get well living under such horribly oppressive conditions. And as I got to know the place better, I became leader of a large program of volunteers. We'd bring in 200 Harvard Radcliffe volunteers and um, and and uh, just begin to change the hospital quite a bit for the better. Uh, I just didn't see any big difference between me and the patients. I mean, this was the key. I mean, I thought to myself, I mean, uh, when I saw a Radcliffe, an ex-Radcliffe student, they were almost proud, you know, they had a Radcliffe student lying on the floor um, uh, next to a radiator. And uh, I thought to myself, there but for the grace of God go I. I mean, I I was no stalwart of mental health at the (laughs) age of 18. I was... You know, I knew how vulnerable I was, <clears throat> and I felt very fortunate to to have the the intelligence to read and to think and to work my way, you know, in, into an increasingly mature, still working on it, uh, a place <laughs> in this world. This is a hard. I knew it was a hard world already when I was eighteen, and 
And I think that that has been my guiding principle. Uh, there, for, there, but for the grace of God, go I. So when I meet my patients, first of all, I don't look down on them. I feel grateful that they were, uh, would like to come to me for help. I feel it's a sacred trust. I want to understand what's troubling them. Why are they suffering? And in that process, it becomes so clear that every single thing that's fundamental to psychiatry is wrong. Um, now, at the time, interestingly enough, psychiatry didn't look as bad as it does today. Uh, at that point, uh, there was room for a person like me who was saying, well, let's take a psychosocial approach. I actually set up a program where each of the le those of us who were really active, and I knew each and I could vet everybody, 15 of us, we each were... We, uh, we, get, we got a clinical program where we could each see our own patient and be supervised. Uh, I was already threatening. They, they, <laughs> you know, talk about the, the threats you were undergoing right. as, as a medical, a medical student. student. And here I'm just, a, uh, by now, maybe a sophomore at college. And uh, I'm saying to the, the, to the superintendent, I think that we can help your patients if we each get one of our own. And the superintendent is telling me, I run this place, not you. And I'm looking at him and saying, well, I think Boston State Hospital, which was a different hospital, I think that they might be interested in the program. And so he, you know, I'd already brought so much positive um, press coverage to the program that he said, all right, you can do it. And we ended up, we didn't know this would happen, getting almost every single patient out of the hospital. Uh, this is written up as the start of toxic psychiatry. And uh, then we got lauded on a national level and so on and so forth. Well, that can't happen now. That program died as psychiatry became totally drug-oriented, totally sales wing of the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, the psychosocial wing died, the psychoanalytic wing died, the community psychiatry wing died. You could, you could get uh, residencies and all these kinds of programs. Now the only program is uh, whatever's dictated at the time by the pharmaceutical industry who pays off all the leaders in psychiatry to dance to their tune. It's that bad. And just one last sentence to sum it all up. So I'm now in the place being a psychiatrist, and for years and years and years, my latest blog is what's the most dangerous thing you can do uh, today? And the answer is go to a psychiatrist yeah. because you will virtually always, unless there's some extraordinary exception, um, the psychiatrist within 10 minutes will make up his mind what drugs he's going to suggest, urge, or push on you and lie about to get you to take them. And I mean lie. Lies like, you have a biochemical imbalance. You need to take this for the rest of your life. Neither of which is true. There are no biochemical imbalances and there are no rest of your life studies of right. drugs. So, well, listen, it's not... In, in, but, in but let, me just, let me just finish with this one thought, and that is I've now written, Dr. Hotze, that the most dangerous thing you can do is go to a psychiatrist and you should look for other solutions if you're suffering. Well, yeah. this, this is a key point. And folks, it's not just psychiatrists. Look, we do health and wellness here at the Hotze Health and Wellness Center. And the individuals that come to us are about 75% women uh, come to see right. us at the Hotel Health and Wellness Center. And of that, about three-quarter of those women, three out of every four, have been to see just a local doctor, their family and doctor or yes. internist, and they have been prescribed, uh, or taken or been prescribed antidepressant therapy, anti-anxiety medication. I'm talking about the Prozacs and all the derivatives of Prozac. I'm talking about... Um, I'm talking about all the anti-anxiety drugs that are out there. And, the, and then sleep medication. They've got them on three or four uh, psychotropic drugs just by walking into a doctor's office saying that you feel fatigued and tired and think something's wrong with you. Now, you make a great point. That's absolutely right. Absolutely you, right. You make a great point about the pharmaceutical companies because they perpetrated an incredible fraud upon the medical profession and upon literally millions of patients through their deceptive research, their business practices, their advertising regarding the safety and effectiveness of antidepressants, which began really in the early 1990s. And this deception by the drug company 
has been perpetrated on the America public. I want to I want you to listen to this with the collusion of the FDA. Literally millions of patients have suffered severe and debilitating side effects, even suicide from the use of antidepressants or the withdrawal reactions that can occur with the discontinuation of these antidepressants. Antidepressants are addictive, and I want you to talk about that, Dr. Bregan, and they do create withdrawal reactions seen in a vast majority of patients who try to stop using them. So you can't stop. If you're on antidepressant, folks, don't stop it. You can't stop it cold. You've got to be weaned off that very slowly, and we can talk about that later. But, doctor, let's talk about the antidepressants, particularly the SSRI, which, folks, is a medical term for selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. By the way, I'm going to make a point here. All these antidepressants, the SSRI antidepressants and the um, serotonin norepinephrine uptake uh, inhibitors, SNRI antidepressants, are all knockoffs of a drug that's very common on the street, and it's called cocaine. All these drugs, if you look at their molecular formulas, are very similar to cocaine, but the drug companies have put on some side chains, and then they've done their studies and tests, and then they, they prescribe these various drugs, which are highly addictive. And they're meant to be that way because if you're a drug company, you want people to take these drugs the rest of their lives, and they can't get off of them. What happens, you, people say, I tried to stop it, but, oh, I felt terrible, and I had these shooting lightning bolts in my brain, and I had these terrible thoughts, and I felt horrible. I ached all over, and so I took it again, and I felt good, so I really must need it. No, it's withdrawal, folks. So talk about, talk to us about, Prozac, when you first got involved, the increased incidence of suicide when Prozac came out in 1988, and the work you did to go before the FDA to try to get them to warn people about the side effects of these drugs and how long it took you in your work before the FDA finally was willing to put a black label warning on these antidepressants. That's tremendous work you did there, and that took a tremendous amount of, I, you know, just determination, indomitable spirit. Yes. And I, and I want to thank you for that, for what you've done yeah. on that. So talk about that. What, tell us about in that beginning when Prozac first came out and the increased incidence of suicide, how you got involved in reversing this, whole, uh, reversing this or at least bringing it and exposing it to the public and at the FDA and how you got them to at least reverse policy on uh, labeling their drugs. Yeah, let me, let me think a minute and organize. I want to start with a distinction between two different kinds of addiction. In one kind of addiction, the drug brings pleasure and stimulation and a euphoria uh, when almost whenever you use it. And that's more the amphetamines and the cocaine drugs. And then when you withdraw from them, you crash and uh, just have a horrible withdrawal. The misleading and confusing thing about the antidepressants is that they don't bring people a lot of pleasure. What they basically do is they blunt your emotions. Right. So the doctors get away with saying these aren't addictive because the patient doesn't crave usually more and more and more. I mean, by the time they start craving more and more, it makes them so toxic they're lying in bed. Right. So what what makes them so addictive in a very basic sense is exactly what you said, and that's the withdrawal. It's not the pleasure. It's not the high, although some people will get a high from the drugs. That's not the basic effect. The basic effect is blunting. And people then, when, when they realize they're blunted and they don't have the quality of life they used to, uh, they, um, if they try to come off them abruptly, they go into a terrible crash not unlike the amphetamine crash, uh, it may be harder to come off the antidepressants than the amphetamines or even cocaine or heroin. Um, they cause people all kinds of neurological terrible problems that make them feel they're crazy. They get shocks in the head and weird feelings and they can get very depressed. They get suicidal. So these are drugs, as Dr. Hotze is very responsibly telling you, that you can't just stop and come off. I've written in the only medical book. Uh, it's also written for the public. I write everything for everybody. 
but it's a basically it's a medical book called Psychiatric Drug Withdrawal. No other psychiatrist has really gotten out there and even written that kind of book. Um, it's just astonishing that all they're trained in now and um, is in how to give the drugs. They get angry at their patients. If you go to your psychiatrist and say, I, I heard Dr. Hotze and Peter Bregan on the, on the television and uh, this is what they said, you'll be treated the way Dr. Hotze was treated in medical school. They try to either fire you or, or, or take you off right away so that you'll have a terrible time. They're not likely to say, well, yeah, let's consider this. Another b b basic point I want to make is it will be helpful to realize that all psychoactive drugs are neurotoxins. We have no drug that makes the brain whiz along better than ever. It's too complicated, the brain. We can do good nutrition will help, exercise will help, uh, all kinds of modalities from acupuncture and meditation um, to just uh, eating a more plant-based diet right. will, will tremendously help your brain. But don't trust the idea that you can take something specific to change your brain function. Um, from my viewpoint, at least, there may be differences about this. The brain is too complex for that. And what happens when you smoke marijuana or drink alcohol or take a psychiatric drug, whatever good effect you are feeling is because your brain has been disabled. Your brain has lost its edge. With the antidepressants, it, it generally loses its edge in a very global, subtle way that I call medication spellbinding. So you may be on the drug from anywhere from a week to a few years before everyone around you kind of knows something's the matter and you think you're getting old or you just don't have your old enthusiasm and it never dawns on you and your doctor won't tell you that uh, this is uh, actually the grinding loss of, uh, of your faculties that occurs with the chronic exposure to psychoactive substances. They're just not good for the brain. And um, uh, again, the psychiatric drugs, they're harder to come off than marijuana, for example, and um, you need to be real careful about it. And about all the stuff I did, I really thank you for that wonderful description. I have little to add to it, uh, <clears throat> except to say that <clears throat> one of the ways I got so involved in this is that I was asked to be the single scientist for all the combined lawsuits against Eli Lilly for Prozac. So a federal court appointed me at the request of a committee of lawyers to be the one person who would go and to find out everything there was to know about Prozac in about 1993 or four, which was still pretty early on. And I got the opportunity as a result of that to interview FDA officials. To go, I took courses that were intended for drug company executives uh, and FDA officials and people like that. Um, I read everything there was. And um, we had a, the first big trial and uh, one of the reasons that Prozac got through it unscarred, basically, was that at the first trial, Prozac people, Eli Lilly, fixed the trial. They bought the other side to throw the trial. And I was the expert there. Wait a minute. They Tell me, they, they, had the, they got the, the plaintiff attorneys to throw the, the trial? They got the plaintiff attorneys to throw the trial in uh, exchange for a huge uh, settlement uh -huh. in, the, in the multi-millions for their multiple plaintiffs. It was a shooting and uh, where a man went into his place of work and shot and killed a number of people and then killed himself. And it was also a very bad case. Uh, and that was prearranged. Uh, see, the, the cases were being brought by by the lead attorney on behalf of of um, of the whole consortium of attorneys as the first case. And I'm looking at it and saying, this is the lousiest case I've seen. The man had threatened to kill people at work before he ever went on the drug. Mm. So I said I wouldn't even testify that the drug caused it per se. I'd only testify that since the drug clearly made him psychotic in the first week 
and was stopped, but he went ahead and killed people because he was psychotic now in his violence. And they were very, you know, they there was a lot of going back and forth about that. But even before I went to trial, months before, it was already fixed because they did 50 or so depositions, Eli Lilly. I was never told that. I was never told about any of the research that was being done outside my own research. And then they, <laughs> this is really funny, Dr. Hodge, they wouldn't even practice me for the trial to get on the stand. They wanted me to go there cold. They didn't give me any questions. And I finally wrote up the night before and sat with six lawyers at dinner and said, this is a bunch of questions. You better ask me these. And I talked to my wife and wow. she said, it's fixed, honey. It's fixed. I said, it can't be fixed. Well, it was fixed, and the, the judge found out, but not until months later, and he reversed the verdict. We still almost had a hung jury because I, I gave my testimony by asking my own questions and answering them. It was quite bizarre. <laughs> and we still, it was nine to two or three, and one more vote, and it would have been a hung trial. It wasn't a complete, wasn't a, you know, one of these verdicts. Right. Uh, but that's how bad it was. And then when the fix was discovered, the judge reversed it and said it was a, um, a settlement with prejudice against Eli Lilly. Then Eli Lilly uh, sued to get the judge removed because he wanted to know how much money had changed hands. And the next judge, imagine what pressure might have been on him or offers. The next judge said, uh, it would be prejudice against Lily to explain how much money they got. So there was not until much later that we learned, of course, it was millions and millions. So this is how far the drug companies go. It's a little known story. I do tell the story in a chapter in the book you mentioned, thank you, which is Medication Madness. I have a chapter on, on, on this uh, story of the power of the drug companies to cheat, steal, and manipulate one of my fears right now politically is that the drug companies are getting this wonderful, enthusiastic endorsement from the government about how wonderful and cooperative and great they are. And they're not, folks. They are not. Right. I'd like to say the, the uh, drug companies are a legalized drug cartel. No different than the drug cartels down in Mexico, but the drug cartels there are illegal. They have, they have got so much money, yeah. literally hundreds of billions of dollars in income come into these companies and <clears throat> they use that for advertising on TV to absolutely brainwash and indoctrinate the American public into thinking that well, I can take this drug and be happy. I mean, you see there, there's uh, what is the drug that they use to stop smoking? Is that Buspar or no Ch Chantil? Well, uh, what is it? Chantex is, is one, but also well, Butrin is used. Yeah. Um, well, you as ought to. Well I was going to say the Chantix commercial is just. You've got to look at that commercial. You go YouTube online. The Chantix commercial. It says if effects. you feel like you're going to, you know, blow your brains out and shoot up your family, you know, be sure <laughs> to tell your doctor. But in the meantime, you know, they're out there having fun and they're not smoking. And it's what a wonderful drug this is. The side effects. I mean. It's laughable, the side effects that they put on it's there really, and expect it, you to yeah. take this drug. It just, it's, it's horrific. Uh, that We have a study of reports to the FDA per prescription uh, for how many reports on violence. So we take all the reports of violence to the FDA. It's done by Thomas Moore, M-O-R-E. You can get on my website. Uh, um, I have a special free uh Resource Center for Antipsychotic Drugs and Antidepressant Drugs at Bregan.com. Okay, that's spelled Bregan, B as in boy, R-E-G-G-I-N. Go, go. B as Thank in boy, R-E-G-G-I-N.com. You go there and you can purchase your books online as well, right, Doctor? Right, and the free resource centers, you can get the Moore article under antidepressants. And, and Shantex is the drug most associated per prescription with violence. And that's um, clearly uh, not because people are mentally ill, it, it's just stopping smoking. Now, some of the violence could be from um, withdrawal from cigarettes, but that was not known as a very severe problem prior to Shantex. So this is the drug Shantex. But, you know, all, all psychoactive drugs have terrible potentials to them 
because they're messing up your particular brain and mess up your particular brain and you may have your particular reaction even though you're not like violent before but your reaction could be violence to many different psychiatric drugs. Many of them now have violence warnings. I mean, how many categories? Antidepressants, mood stabilizers, the stimulant drugs all have stuff in them about hostility, aggression. So, folks, uh, there are so many better ways to heal yourself. And, uh, you know, it has a lot to do with relationship. My, my key I think I say three things, you know, a mild exercise, don't knock your brains out, especially if you're older, um, <clears throat> a, a, a vegetable, plant-based diet as much as you, you can yes. uh, is very, very healthy. Um, and then relationship, relationship with people, with nature, with God, what we thrive on is happy, fulfilling connectedness to the world we've been given. And um, I have a, a TV show. Let me let me uh, talk about that for yeah, a minute. Yeah, go ahead. Please tell us about that. <laughs> real real quick. No, go um, ahead. We want to know. Well, about I've had that. a I've had a radio show for years and uh, a weekly, and now it's TV as well. And you can go um, to Dr. Bregan's um, uh, um, <laughs> YouTube channel. What are you having Dr. a Biden Bregan. moment there? <laughs> yeah, it's <laughs> close, the Joe Biden close moment. My, <laughs> close my eyes and hope to God the word comes. <laughs> tough, that was a tough word too. That uh, <laughs> YouTube is a big one. Uh, got stuck in my tube here, but um, <laughs> we gotta have a sense of humor about ourselves. Yeah. But um, my YouTube channel is really big. It's got a ton of free information on it, and. Um, so, All right, so on the 9th and uh, 10th, April 9th and 10th, you'll see the TV version on my YouTube. And I talk on that show about how do we relate to each other when we're all stuck together? How do we give up the aggressive, irritable, angry things that, uh, that we do? Um, how do we change the way we speak and what kind of words can we use with each other to advance our relationship? Um, I go into a, a real detail about, uh, it's one of the best things I've ever done. And um, I, I really hope that some folks will go and, and it, might, it might turn this lousy virus into an opportunity for you to have a more loving relationship with the people you live with and are sequestered with than you ever imagined. Because I put my whole heart into talking about how to communicate and be with other people. That's wonderful. Now, how can we how can our listening audience um, find this? Um, just go to um, Google Dr. Bregan's YouTube channel. If you will be on the channel, if you see a photograph at the top of a farm scene with bales of hay on the ground, you know you're in. You're at the actual channel. And as of tomorrow, uh, the um, it'll be up as a part of my uh, radio TV uh, program every week. And it'll be this week's show. So, um, and it's a single, many of them I interview people, most are probably interviews, but I also do shows on, I did done one on epidemic anxiety, one on e epidemic shame to go along with these, what's happening to us. And this one is on communic, it's on um, talking together, uh, under confinement and stress. Okay, so what? Amazing. So what we could do is go to you. Just go to you could Google. Go to your go to your browser and 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 Google Doctor Bregan or B R E. Go type. I guess YouTube Bregan, and that that'll all, get you there. YouTube Bregan, <clears throat> B R E G G I N, and uh, you. And, and what it's about your talking t together? Soon you'll be able to just probably Google talking together. Well, we've been yeah. visiting today with Doctor. Peter Bregan, who is a giant in natural approaches to uh, interpersonal problems that people sometimes call psychiatric problems. And when you end up seeing the psychiatrists, they're really, according to them, drug problems. You need drugs. Dr. Bregan has a completely contrarian yeah. approach to addressing people's individual problems from an interpersonal relationship point of view, helping them solve their problems without the use of any pharmaceutical psychotropic drugs. He's been a leader 
in exposing the uh, terrible overuse and really the use of these psychotropic drugs, uh, electroconvulsive therapy, lobotomies that the that the uh, psychiatric profession has adopted over the years. So we thank him for his work. Thank you, Dr. Bregan, for your marvelous work over the years and your dedication to helping people have a purposeful, meaningful life without using pharmaceutical drugs, particularly psychiatric drugs. We appreciate you. We admire you. And we thank you so very much for joining us today on Dr. Hotsey's Wellness Revolution podcast and YouTube channel. And thank you, too, doctor. And I want your audience to know what courage it takes to be a man like you. Folks, you can't imagine what they try to do to anyone from ordinary folks to radio show people to doctors, what they try to do to people who speak truth about psychiatry and the drug companies. So you've been very brave, sir. And I thank you. Thank you, sir. And God bless you. We look forward to having you back on in the near future. If you would like to find out more ways to be naturally healthy and well, then you can go to HOTZEHWC.com. That's H-O-T-Z-E-H-W-C.com. Or call us at 281-698-8698. That's 281-698-8698. Thank you for joining us here today on Dr. Hotze's Wellness Revolution. A special thanks to Physicians Preference Pharmacy, formerly Hotze Pharmacy, proud sponsor of Dr. Hotze's Wellness Revolution podcast. Information provided on this radio program is neither intended nor implied to be a substitute for professional medical advice and is not intended to replace the services of a physician, nor does it constitute a doctor-patient relationship. You should not use information from this radio program to diagnose or treat a health problem or disease without consulting with a qualified health care provider. If you have or suspect you have an urgent medical problem, promptly contact a professional health care provider or call 911. Dr. Hotze's Wellness Revolution radio program advises you to always seek the advice of a physician or other qualified health provider prior to starting any new treatment or with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition. Any application of the recommendations from this radio program is at the listener's discretion.